Good evening and welcome to Plain Talk. Our topic this evening is transparency and development. Um, to discuss these, our topic with us are two leading members of the Guyana Entity Transparency Institute Guyana Inc. The, to my immediate right is Mr. Gino Passau, the former president of Transparency Institute, and to his right, Mr. Calvin Bernard, who is the serving member and president of Transparency. Gentlemen, welcome to Plain Talk. Thank you very much. We hear a lot about transparency and if it can address the question of, of corruption, and, and in fact it's supposed to address the question of corruption, it should lead to development. Is there a necessary link between transparency and development? Anybody? Well, Chris, um, thank you for having us. Uh, to answer your question, of course, there is uh, definitely a nexus between uh, improving transparency and accountability, reducing corruption, and so on, as means of improving uh, a country's development. Transparency Guyana, as you know, was formed in 2010 with the express mandate of reducing corruption, promoting transparency and accountability because at that time um, it was felt by us, the founding members, that transparency or the lack thereof was a serious problem and corruption, in fact the perception of corruption was a serious problem in Guyana. As you know, the annual corruption perceptions index of Transparency International which is released in December of every year, um, consistent, consistent, consistently ranks Guyana uh, at the bottom of the English-speaking Caribbean. So, in short, yes, uh, it is directly related to development, and it is one of the fundamental reasons that led to the creation of our organization, promoting transparency and accountability. Calvin? Well, there are two elements of, uh, I think, what transparency um, engenders that I think is critical for um, for development and, and more so for the sustainability of development. And that is uh, allowing for participation, allowing people to, to, to be able to uh, become involved in the democratic processes related to development and also for equity. Because what, what uh, corruption in itself does is, is promote a lot of inequity within the society. And I think when you look at uh, the, in order for transparency to truly materialize, you must have people being involved. They're informed, and beyond being informed, they get involved in processes. And, and with that, people are, uh, they, they tend to own, um, I use that word, they really own the development themselves, and that in itself allows for um, sustainability. I, I don't want to stop you, but could you give us an example? Well. Take a road contract, perhaps. Right. So, so I was going to look at that infrastructural contract. You yes. know, the, the decision to take to uh, undertake a particular uh, project, uh, if it is made at a high level, and and the, all the decisions are taken there, then the persons who you, you might very well want to uh, be improving the lives of a particular community, but if the decision is taken at a high level and it does not fit well with what the community would like to have. To, to, to see done as a priority, then you can find people disowning a particular thing. So they don't feel that this is my project, this is our project, and, and so they step back from it. If, if it goes bad, they're not getting involved in saying that the contractor isn't doing the job, that he didn't do this, and he's supposed to do that. They don't even care. But if it's a, a case where the community has been, the, the information is out there, we're going to uh, invest X amount of dollars in a community, what does the community see as important? <coughs> And they become involved in that decision making uh, to to spend that uh, project money. Then the community begins to think this is our project, not just the government's project. And I think if you uh, move away from this thing being it's a government project to it being our project, it's something that uh, will have a significant impact. Do you know you mentioned that um, Transparency Institute was formed in 2010? Yes. As um, 
Just so I, I think it was the latter part of the year, if I recall. Yes, October, November yeah. 2010. How effective would you rate the organization over its relatively short life? Yes, about Transparency Ghana over its relatively short life has um, managed to contribute enormously to the national um, conversation on corruption. Um, Transparency Ghana was launched in 2010 with a Freedom of Information um, seminar. As you know, one of our early um, calls was for the implementation of access to information legislation. Um, we have done a considerable amount of public information um, exercises on what corruption is, the definition of corruption in a way which is put over in a way that the ordinary person would understand um, not only what corruption is, but the effects of corruption. We have done a lot of that through uh, public education exercises. We had, um, we've created uh, a lot of brochures which have been disseminated, um, flyers, public billboards. You would have seen two public billboards um, on the corruption and the effects of corruption. We did about five uh, video public service um, announcements on combating corruption and promoting accountability, etc. We've had some very high profile um, fundraising dinners, which has turned into a sort of our signature annual event in which we invite prominent personalities to speak on corruption. The first year, we had um, Derek Murray, former West Indian cricketer who was head of the Trinidad and Tobago Transparency Institute. The second year, we had um, the gentleman who was in charge of the Jamaican National um, Transparency Institute. Um, and the third year, we had uh, Just of course, a a formal uh, chancellor of Ghana and retired CCG judge. Calvin, um, how would you rate the effectiveness, given that you now have to <laughs> s to, to um, follow that high standard that Gino set out? Well, I think to rate the effectiveness of the institution, you also have to recognize when the institution was uh, created, within what uh, context. And the fact that it is still existing is something to note, I think, uh, as something, you know, it, it, it goes without saying that the institution has done a lot, but it's also uh, done a lot against a very hard, <laughs> you know, within very difficult environment, we put it that way. Um, so even just being able to say that the Transparency Institute is still alive and functioning uh, today is something that is uh, critical. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I think being able to inform uh, the, the populace, make them more aware of some of the critical issues and just basically understanding uh, when we talk about corruption, what is it we're talking about? I think that's the starting point. And I said it's a relatively young uh, organization. Uh, and well, still need what, what does, when we talk about corruption, what are we talking about? How, how is it defined by, for TG purposes and, or international standard purposes? Well, uh, for the quote, I, I would defer to Gino to, to pull the quote because I know he pulls it right off his head very easily. It, ha it has to do with abuse of power. Yes, it's use of public office for yes. private gain. The definition that we use, which is Transparency International's definition, is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Right. Mm -hmm. This is what we use. But we know that um, we had an impact on the national scene based also on the response of the then government, because the, then gov the, the government at that time um, was very critical of Transparency Again and its directors. So we knew that the impact was being felt based on the hostile criticisms that were leveled against us almost from the beginning. From the beginning, you had um, in early 2011, which is just a few months after the organization was formed and we had that Freedom of Information seminar, etc. You had the acting foreign affairs minister at that time, Manzur Nadir, who actually wrote Transparency International in Germany, calling for a purge of the <laughs> local organization. It is laughable. It is laughable. I mean, could you imagine um, the current Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Carl Greenwich, firing off a letter to Transparency International calling for 
Calvin and Gino to be purged from Transverse again because we are it's a very Soviet era kind of language. <laughs> I tell you, it's it's amazing. You know, I, we recorded. We we have the letter. We the, we of course we were contacted by uh, Transparency International in Germany. Actually, concerns were expressed, but it is the language that was used, the language calling for a purge of the Guyana chapter, saying that you know the persons who set it up were hostile to the government of Guyana, hostile to the PPP. These persons were bitter. They had access to grind. They had known biases against the government of Guyana, and therefore we were somehow incapable of promoting transparency and accountability. Quite absurd when you think about it. In fact, I have it right here on my iPad, the statement of Manzur Nadir at that time. You know, he attacked directors individually, um, in some cases stating deliberate falsehoods. In my case, for example, he said the government had cause to remove Gino Prasad from the University of Guyana Council, which was a complete fabrication. I was nominated by the government to serve on the University Council. I did so as a representative of the legal community for four years, for the life of the council. When the life of the council expired, um, a new council was formed. So there was no question of the government removing me. It's suggesting that there was some fault or misconduct on my part. But this is, was the sort of uh, behavior that was prevailing at that time. It was a complete falsehood. And several directors, apart from myself, were directly attacked using similar falsehoods. And you're con considering so consider that yourself lucky, <laughs> <laughs> Calvin. You, you've come, you've taken... Just the, towards the end of you've that. You've taken the presidency at the time <laughs> where, when the climate is very different. Well, well, you'd hope that it's maintained in that way, and, and, and you know, of course, we're looking forward to a different kind of a relationship with uh, the administration and future administrations um, in general. Uh, but it's not to be taken for granted that it will, um, uh, by default, be different. I mean, we have to work towards that. But by its very nature, an organization like Transparency Institute, Transparency International, and given the definition, use of public office. So essentially, you're speaking of public administration. You're speaking either or of local or national government. You would expect an element of tension in the relationship, wouldn't you? Yes. Or the mandate itself is controversial. As soon as you talk about corruption, it becomes controversial. Because we know at that time when the organization was set up, the perception of corruption was a serious problem in Guyana. So it was a very sensitive um, topic. You wanted to say something? No, I was just going to say that the, the, just the uh, mere fact that you have an organization of this sort created uh, indicates that there is an issue to be addressed. You wouldn't create something that has no purpose in the society. So I think that's what uh, a lot of what the then government was reacting to, uh, that, that by having a transparency organization emerging within uh, the society under their government, I meant that people were saying, we have corruption. And, and then they were saying, well, we can't say that we have corruption, so we must say that these people have no relevance. Of course, they could have said, we have democracy. They could have seen a positive light in it, here is an organization being encouraged and, and, and supported by the state. Because surely corruption is as much in the interest of the populace as it is for the government, is it? Yes, you, yes, of course. And I think, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't expect, I, w I wouldn't think there's a single country on earth that has um, zero corruption. So we all would be aspiring for that. And so in every country, there would be a need for such an organization. The work might be <laughs> heavier in some than others, but there's a need in every single country. And I think just by being pretending as if there isn't a need you know, was a, a, a huge problem. I think once we accept that, and I know the, the current administration, of course, they're in a very early stage. You know, we need to really have a discussion about the new administration uh, a few years down the line. 
we'll, to really we'll, judge we'll them, compare we'll, them. We'll, 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 we'll start of, and I do. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of what you see you don't now... Give people, you don't give people two years to start no, making I'll tell you why I'm saying two years and to look at them and compare the two, because if you start a conversation now, you're really talking about them looking at what existed before. There are a few, a, a month, just over a month, in, in, in office and you know you, you're really looking at what existed before they can talk a lot about what we inherited but if you give some time then what is inherited should be changed to what should be uh, proper and what should be right and fitting and then we can say well what did you do well um in other words, you can judge them on, on, on their own... Um, yes, um, but let, me, let me take you back. What they have done, their own work. When the PPPC administration, uh, which turned out to be uh, the, the target of lots of accusations about, of, of corruption, when they started out in 1992, what was the, what was the label? Lean and clean. So you don't, you don't give people any chance. You, you have to make sure... You keep those standards as high as they are from day one. Rightfully, what, what I was talking about really is being able to compare the two governments. Not not to say you give a honeymoon, extended honeymoon period, but rather being able to compare the government. You can't really, there, there's nothing really to measure. They have just started working. Uh, so you, you, that is uh, where you're saying give the piece of, of the space. But of course, in terms of dealing with the issues that may arise as they go, that's something we have to do. I think the, that transition, that change, gives us a significant opportunity to uh, hit the ground running with the government, working to ensure that we eliminate any uh, form of corruption and we promote transparency in everything that is done. So you, you don't allow, uh, in that regard, you don't allow them to develop systems that then are inherently corrupted or corruptible, uh, and then you start attacking the problem. You deal with it from the first sign. We're taking a retrospective approach uh, at this stage. Um, we'll get to the present and, and, and future. But apart from the Mr. Manzur Nadir, you did have issues with Ms. Gail Teixeira. I remember Demarara Life Building, Ms. Teixeira came. Um, she, was, she was blazing. Dr. Ashti Singh was also very critical and cynical. Um, but well, we faced uh, lots of those criticisms over the past five years, and it was not only a question of public criticism, but you also had instances of victimization. I had my own personal instance of victimization where I was um, headhunted by an Icelandic company, Credit Info International, to set up Guyana's first credit bureau. I was headhunted to be the CEO. I functioned as interim CEO for the credit bureau, but and I did so for six months, but when it was time for the credit bureau to be licensed by the Bank of Guyana, which is the legal and regulatory body, the supervisory body, the government instructed the Bank of Guyana to withhold the license as long as Giro Prasad was CEO because he was seen to be hostile to the government. He was seen to be anti-government. And they called my clients in and told them exactly that. We're not prepared to give you a license to operate a credit bureau in Guyana with Giro Prasad as CEO because he's hostile to this government. So that was a level of victimization that um, some of us experienced. Apart from that, you had uh, instances of character assassination, anonymous defamation on the government blogs, etc. We saw in recent times, uh, well, over the past couple of weeks since the new administration took office, um, confirmation from Office of the President that a number of persons existed on their payroll um, who were more or less phantom bloggers. We knew this all along, that when persons like Anand Golsaran, myself, um, Nadia, etc. were being attacked continuously, being defamed uh, on these blogs and so on. We knew that it was done by a group of persons who were paid to do this. And now it is coming out that, uh, it, that such a unit existed at the office of the president. So you had direct attacks, you had indirect attacks. And Chris, you also bore the brunt of that, you would know. <laughs> well, I mean, 
in a society, you, you don't just expect an organization like Transparency Institute, and we can talk about difficulties in financing, but you have the audit profession, the legal profession, you have the rest of civil society because you're part of civil society. To what extent did those elements provide any kind of support in all the victimization, the discrimination, and the attacks that people had to bear? The prevailing climate at that time was one of silence. As you know, um, the we received very little support. We received publicly. We received a lot of support behind the scenes, but when it came to putting a name and a face to the organization, persons were reluctant, very reluctant, um, because they felt uh, the threat of being attacked, the threat of victimization, etc., was real. So at that time, when we functioned, we functioned with very little public support but with a lot of private support. You, you weren't very prominent in Transparency Institute at that stage. I'm very new to Transparency <laughs> Institute. I mean, two years in. <laughs> you, you belong to a union, uh, one of the more vocal unions. He belongs to university first and foremost. <laughs> yes. He's a university lecturer. Do you feel the University of Guyana, academia, and your union let down Transparency Institute. The union you're referring to, let me just be clear. <coughs> the union you're referring yes, to. Yes, the, the union, the University of Ghana. Yes, uh, senior staff. Well, I, I would think, I'm trying to consider what might have been the role of, of the, the Senior Staff Association as a union. I mean, it, it, it in itself was um, trying to, uh, to, to work out uh, some issues, which I would, I, I wouldn't, I'm not uh, totally uh, familiar with the depths of them, but I know that the, the UGSSA was just trying to work its own way up and, and reestablish itself. It was coming out of something. So I think the union was not in a position to address it from that standpoint. The university, on the other hand, um, you'd expect that uh, academics, you know, they have that license to say whatever they want and then put it under the cap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I remember interacting with some of my colleagues from UWI. And I, I, I had one uh, economics professor who was repeating that over and over. It stuck in my head. And it's a good thing. The academic cap, you can say anything you want, just have your uh, your uh, logics for it, and then you put it under the academic cap, right? Even though that academic cap doesn't have the same kind of safety <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, in Guyana you as you have, have in other places, right? Um, but addressing the issue, <laughs> give it a, addressing the issue though, the, the, the question that you've asked, I think very little was done. I think there's a lot more to be done, and I think the... Uh, not just the academics at the university, but the educated Guyanese, those that have been afforded uh, the opportunity uh, to uplift themselves in education, have a responsibility to the society also. Uh, to be able to uh, guide, uh, to, to provide um, you know, wisdom to the society in general, uh, and speak on issues, and, no. and call spade spade. I was just going to say that to be fair to Calvin in the university, the university has had its fair share of challenges. But in terms of um, support and so on, I just wanted to add very quickly that it took us some considerable work with the <coughs> Private Sector Commission, for example, to before we got to a stage where we were comfortable with each other. We, had, we started off, um, I suspect, with the Private Sector Commission, distrusting um, transparency again. So you had, we started off at opposite ends. But over a period of time, we were able to work together where we, we had some fruitful meetings, we put out some joint positions, etc. But that took a process. When we had our first press conference, where, when, we, when the s uh, annual corruptions perceptions index was launched in 2011, it was our first um, public launch of the CPI. We did a press conference, etc. Of course, Guyana ranked very poorly. Um, I think we were 134 uh, out of 184 countries at that time. Um, but the, the backlash to our uh, press conference and our public dissemination of that position was severe. From whom? From the government, <laughs> from the private sector. You had 
um, I, uh, the very next day, you had a senior executive of the Private Sector Commission, Jerry Gavaya, mm -hmm. being given front page prominence in the Guyana Chronicle and the Guyana Times blasting um, the directors of Transparency Guyana, calling us prophets of doom and gloom and negaholics and persons who were against development, anti-development, etc. Today, Mr. Jerry Gavaya is a member of Transparency Guyana. Card carrying one. <laughs> Card carrying one. <laughs> but we had a lot of meetings with the Private Sector Commission executive after that. And I feel we were also able to clarify a lot of misconceptions um, and misperceptions that existed. Uh, of, of a lot of persons around that table, for example, simply felt that Transparency Guyana had somehow cooked up this CPI on our own. When we explained the methodology, we explained that this is a worldwide um, survey. And it's not only a single survey, it's based, it's on, a based on a series of indices, yes. And more importantly, indexes, yes. more importantly, the national uh, chapters for, ev for each country does not have any they input matter, yeah. whatsoever. So that, uh, that was conducted entirely by Transparency International. Well, so mm -hmm. the minute we began to clear up a lot of those misconceptions, uh, the climate improved. You know, two comments, if I may. Sure. One I mean. is to recognize the evolution. You, you, you reference uh, Jerry Gavaya, and you must recognize the evolution that he made from, from first being completely opposed and suspicious of to becoming a member. That's one thing to recognize. The other thing with regards to the um, CPI, one of the things we're doing, uh, we just had a conversation about it, myself and the uh, appropriate director. Uh, within the board now, we have uh, Dr. Troy Thomas, who's at the university, also a colleague of mine in natural sciences. His specialization is in survey methodology. So one of the things he's going to be doing in preparation for the December uh, release of the CPI is to examine the methodology so that when we s speak about uh, the, the CPI in December, <coughs> we'll be able to speak authoritat authoritatively on the methodology as well as the outcomes of it. So to address some of those fears and concerns that persons may, uh, in some cases, genuinely have, because you just don't know. I'm, I'm going to step out a little bit. You, you raised the question of Chronicle, the Ghana Chronicle. How well does the Ghana Chronicle at any time, past and present, serve the issue and cause of transparency? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> tempted to jump at something here. It's not, it's not uh, something directly from TIGI, but I remember just, um, uh, just early in June, uh, I had released uh, something that ordinarily, because I'd, I'd written a number of things and sent it to all the, um, the media houses, and a few of them would take it up. Guyana Chronicle never did. They were the first to publish <laughs> on the issue of uh, the, the uh, membership to parliament and dual citizenship. They were the first ones to publish. So I, I would recognize that shift in the past. Is, is that shift, Gino, I know you, I know you um, deflected the question, um, but I wouldn't <laughs> allow you to um, continue <laughs> that. Is that shift purely opportunistic? It's difficult to say so soon, I think it is quite obvious that change would have had to follow the results of the elections. But we also should recognize that preceding um, the results of these elections, um, the media, the pro-government media, state-owned media and pro-government media was very hostile to any sort of criticism. So the Chronicle was tightly controlled. If you look at the board of editors, um, not the board of editors, the, the board itself, you would see they were all pro-government people. And when you look at the editorial content of the Chronicle over the past couple of years, you saw a rapid deterioration. It got worse. So it meant, the it, it was commensurate with the situation in the country. As it got worse, the tightening of the reins increased. So there was virtually um, no criticism allowed in the, in the Chronicle, uh, any sort of criticism against the government. My question and was, how, how does that help this issue of transparency? Well, it didn't help it at all then, but the opportunity now presents itself a change. 
and hopefully we will see some of that change in the state media I and uh, wait, wait. go on go ahead uh, i was just going to say you know I, there's one uh, thing that I, I would like to see, uh, I would hope to see addressed and, and look for the differences in, in this uh, dispensation. We just say that I'd seen in, in the Chronicle operate in such a fashion that you send uh, a letter to the editor there, they would not publish it. It would be published in another paper, but then they would publish yeah, a, a, a response to it. <laughs> That's not journalism. It's not. No. <laughs> Okay, so we've, we've, we've had the issues. Um, the PPP brought in the Access to Information Act. I think, I think Transparency Institute had argued for a Freedom of Information Act. How well has this act operated in terms of making information more easily accessible? Um, in other words, for the objects of this act, to have been realized? Well, um, yes, the Access to Information Act um, is now operational. I think it was passed in Parliament in 2011, and there was a considerable period um, between the date it became operational and the date it was passed. I think it became operational in 2013. July 1. 2013. It was p it was signed into law on September 27, 2011. I remember that before and the election. Order 14 of 2013 brought it into, into operation, operation on July 1, 2013. Right. So it is a very we have to recognize that it is a very new piece of legislation. New to Guyana, but it, uh, you've got access to information for new freedom to Guyana. of in information act all around the place. I meant new to Guyana. Yes, that is what I meant. Now, we have to understand that access to information, or what you called, you use the term just now, freedom of information, and that we were calling for freedom of information legislation. I don't think there is any um, serious discrepancy with, the, in, with how you title the act, but it is access to information is based, and we should recognize this, it is based on the right of the public to know. So we need to understand that in any modern um, functioning democracy, citizens have a right to know. And access to information legislation, or what is loosely referred to as freedom of, of information legislation, is based on our right to know. The public right to know, citizens' right to know, our right to know. And that is a fundamental tenet of any democracy. As far as... As far as... As far as Transparency Guyana goes, Yes, so the short definition of the access, it is to provide for setting out a practical regime of right to information for persons to secure access to information under the control of public authorities in order to promote transparency and accountability in the working of the government and public authorities and for the appointment of the Commissioner of Information. So as far as Transparency Guyana goes, it is very important to us because um, as long as you have access to information legislation, we believe it promotes um, transparency and accountability and works to prevent corruption. However, the Access to Information Act in Guyana, we believe, is serious, seriously deficient. There are lots of challenges with the legislation. In this legislation, we have to remember, was passed in Parliament before 2011 when the PPP had a majority. Yes. So they put forward a draft bill which was entirely in conformity with their political expectations and what they wanted to be passed in Parliament. The situation, as we know, changed after 2011. The, gov the government had lost the majority. So that was one of the last pieces of, of legislation that went through, which was basically, I would say, a, a piece of legislation that the PPP was very comfortable with. And we're not comfortable with it because it provides for <coughs> the appointment of a single commissioner of information. We know after 2013 that commissioner of information um, is 
uh, Justice uh, Charles Ramson, who was also a political attorney general under the PVP administration. So it differs from several other jurisdictions um, in terms of its scope and in terms of the large amount of exemptions in the Act and I think the workability of the Act. In other jurisdictions, for example, you do not have a single commissioner of information, one person who is this information mm -hmm. czar. I think the Act says, uh, he acts the, the Commissioner of Information acts as a clearing house. So it means you have to go through one person. Um, you have to channel all of your requests through one person. Um, and in this case, one person who was partisan to the PPP because he was uh, a political authority general for the PPP, I think on two or three occasions. In many other countries, most of the public authorities have uh, information officers. So you can approach that, uh, uh, that public authority directly. If you want to go to the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. and you need something from the Ministry of Health, you could file your request with the information officer at that ministry and you can either receive your request or if it is turned down there is a mechanism for and you and you use the regulator as, as a complaining complaint authority yes in you can either appeal or you can go to court etc etc but in this case all requests are channeled to one um, person a commission of information who is the clearing house i don't like it at all i think it places too much um power and discretion in one person. Mr. Yeah. Bernard, sorry. I, I was just going to say it would be, uh, I think, of value to share our own experience with um, the act and, and sort of putting it into action. <laughs> what a better word. Well, how, how, um, how well has, ha, in your opinion, given, regardless of whatever flaws it has, and, and I think it has many, maybe I should disclose that I'm one of the founding members, of Transparency Institute. Um, I'm currently a director as well. I, I, but, I mean, this act, when it was passed, nothing in this act shall be construed as compelling a public authority to disclose or make available any information or record created before the commencement of this act. Yes. So they got away with <coughs> more, all kinds of things. Now, what are you going to do about it? About all these flaws that your uh, erstwhile um, predecessor Gino Passod now identifies as, as so many of these flaws. What are you going to do about them? You made an interesting comment before you asked that question, identifying yourself <laughs> as a director <laughs> on the board. <laughs> and I can pretty much toss the question back at you. But the, the um, act is, of course, something that is uh, pivotal to uh, us achieving um, our uh, goal of promoting um, transparency and eliminating the corruption. So uh, those flaws that we're already aware of, and I'm sure there are others that uh, more, uh, even more careful study will reveal, those things we will uh, most definitely address with um, the, the uh, Parliament to ensure that the Act um, is very swiftly uh, revised so that we can have something that is um, more appropriate and useful uh, in our context to achieve the aim that it was set out for. You know, we tested this. And it was made public. <laughs> right? It you know, that, that, that particular point you tested about the this one, the, the, act, the act. The act. Yes. And, and what I'm happened? Say, tell, the view, tell the viewers what. So it was made public. I mean, w th there was a, a letter sent requesting information. I, I can't remember the particular issue now, Gino might recall. But we did request a particular bit of information from the commissioner. We got a response, which was interesting. But the response was saying, we have no money to respond to you about the information that you um, requested. And it was subsequently found out that he wasn't telling the truth. Well, we knew before he wasn't telling the truth. But no. the point the point of that's, that's enormous not power that vested in one person. That probably makes him unfit to be a, to continue as, as Commissioner of Insurance, doesn't it? Because to, to, to remain in office, you, you, you have to be... You, you have to have some kind of integrity. This, this is a serious position. Now, well, perhaps we can tell you uh, what we wrote about, the, what the request that was made and the response that we received. And 
uh, maybe viewers can form their own opinions. Yeah. In, on the 9th of June 2014, Transparency Guyana wrote the Commission of Information requesting a copy of a contract between a Canadian firm and the government of Guyana for the development of a custom-built financial management system. We, res we uh, respectfully requested the Commission to provide us with a copy of that contract. He wrote to us, the Commissioner wrote to us, and this was his response. As you are aware, and it is assumed that your acute concerns are national and not partisan in nature, budgetary allocations for this office have been excised from the estimates for 2014, the foreseeable consequences of which need concern your institute pari passu with the effect it will have on the morale of the staff, production and productivity. Regrettably, therefore, your request, even if contemplated by the act creating this office, cannot be considered until such time that retroactive approval is given for resources to be made available to this office. A rudimentary perusal of the, afore of the aforementioned act will inform you of a mandate confirmed, conferred on no less a person than His Excellency the President to provide the commissioner with the appropriate resources. In the words of the famous Calypsonian, Mighty Sparrow, no money, no love. No doubt your institute, if at all influential, could ameliorate the disastrous consequences visited upon workers in general. So this was the arrogant response received from a statutory office holder pursuant to a legitimate request for a piece of information under the access to information. Which all required was a photocopy of a document. Which all it required was a photocopy or maybe uh, an invitation to inspect it because if you look at the schedule of the Act, it says that subject to the provisions of this Act, access to a document may be granted by either supplying a printed copy of it or by making it available for inspection. Or if, by appro or if appropriate, by supplying a copy of a tape, disc, or film. We responded. And we responded by saying as follows. It is true, and this was a direct reference to his point about the budgetary allocation being excised. We responded by saying, after we did the research, that it is true that the National Assembly did not approve of funds for the Office of the President on the program 011 administrative services of 2014 under which the commissioner receives its resources however the minister of finance went ahead and authorized the withdrawal of funds totaling 6.85 million for the office of the commissioner of information for the period 1st of january to 16th of june 2014 this was evidenced by financial paper number one of 2014 statement of access that the minister tabled in the assembly on the 19th of June 2014. The response from your office suggesting that there was no funding for the office and the statement no money no love is not only distasteful but it was misleading. The commissioner of information referred to the morale of his staff as well as production and productivity being adversely affected. However, a perusal of the estimates for 2014 does not indicate the level of staffing of the commissioner's office, but financial paper number one of 2014 indicates that amongst totaling 5.859 million relate to employment costs, while the sum of $1 million relates to other charges. Transparency Guyana would therefore be happy to learn about the level of resources made available to the commissioner. And what was his response? There was no response to that. The Commissioner has trivialized Transparency Guyana's request by quoting the mighty Sparrow, no money, no love, but the mighty Sparrow is an entertainer. Transparency Guyana is not in the business of entertaining. That was our response. That was public. That was a public response. So, we, we now confronted with an act that is deficient and a Commissioner of Insurance... That information. Commissioner of, of Information, sorry. That has really not... Um, but this was a refusal. Yes. This was it, an outright refusal. Yes. He, 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 he clearly did not assist in promoting the objectives of the Act. For example, the, under Section 17, the Commission of Information, in collaboration with the relevant public authority, 
shall take reasonable steps to assist people. In yeah. other words, your task is not is not this bureaucratic, what we used to refer to the public servant, no. But rather, let me see how I can help you. It was a baseless refusal. It was a refusal to even work. That is the bottom line of it. It's pretty much saying we're not going to work. <laughs> now, okay. Let's, so this let's is the sort of culture that we need to change. Well, let's talk about that change. Have you engaged the new administration or the new administration engaged Transparency Institute? We have not engaged as yet. Uh, we have been engaged in a minor way. Um, and that was an invitation from uh, the... Uh, Minister of Cohesion? Yeah, Social Cohesion uh, Ministry. Um, and I, I'm not going to speak to the specific event that they're planning because I, I leave that for them. This is <laughs> sort of a public thing. Um, but we were engaged on plans they're making uh, for an event uh, coming, I think it's September is the date, that the, the month that they're thinking of, um, that will look at addressing their um, their own uh, work as a ministry. But, but I, 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 was I, I am more interested in the government's approach rather than the ministry's approach to your to this legislation and, the, and to the work of Transparency Institute. So speaking specifically to yes. the information and, and, and the Has general there been any work, engagement? No. Uh, we do intend to uh, make an approach to the government in the absence of any. And we're not waiting for them to, uh, to or giving them space to approach us, but rather we are now discussing as a new board, you know, just uh, put in the beginning of this month, we are, well, the last month we are already in uh, July, um, we are having discussions to devise our own approach to the government. Uh, so we want to set ourselves, um, or prepare ourselves, rather, so that when we make an approach, we have done so in a considered uh, manner. So pretty soon, I think within um, the, the, the next month, we should um, take that step forward, if they do not um, take the step before us. Who do you see as the minister, the ministry, that most directly um, impacts on the issue of transparency and, and, uh, and on your organization. Is it the Ministry of Information? I would say several ministries, that because the work cuts across several portfolios. It would have to be Ministry of Finance, the Attorney General's Chamber. Yeah, but because it's centralized, because access to information, as you've just pointed out, is centralized. You want information on finance, you don't go to the Ministry of Finance, you go to the Commission of Information. So where would you think you... But the work is more than just uh, looking at the access to information. Right? There's a lot of work that is um, outside of just simple access to information, even though access to information does uh, drop uh, a very... Um, <laughs> It, it, it raised some critical uh, questions um, in other areas. So, forestry sector, for example, um, there there's uh, negotiation ongoing with regards to uh, voluntary partnership agreement with the uh, European Union. As part of that um, that that discussion uh, or part of that agreement, one annex will address information being made available. There's a transparency type of annex. And in considering what information we would then agree to make available, you have to step back and think of this di very deficient law and how we, uh, what it allows the Forestry Commission to make available um, to the public. That's one part. And also the, 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 that uh, link back to the law is critical, yes. But there are other issues because that don't you're relate right, you're to information. All your right to information is constitutional. There's no question about that. It's constitutional. This act is to give effect yes. to that broad constitutional right. Yes. Um, so this is very important to you. Of course. Um, uh, because this is the mechanism through which and by which you get information. Let me put the question slightly differently then. You've had difficulties with the act. You've had difficulty with the Commission of Information. Would you be calling on the government to say, look, we don't only need a change or changes in the act, we need a new commission of information? 
I can't speak definitively to that because we haven't taken a decision. <laughs> such a, uh, what would be your yeah. personal view? My personal view, yes. We, I, I think that we should see a change because the appointment of the commission should not be a political... Um, it, well, the person should not be political. It, it, it shouldn't be an appointment that suits the party, that makes the, the party and government feel comfortable. You need someone who will look at the interests of the Guyanese people in general. So, so I think it's critical that that person is politically neutral. You know, I would go a little bit further than that to say, to point out that yes, we've had an experience of our organization applying for information and the information, the request being refused by the current office holder. But I would go a bit further to say that when we advocate for reforms to the act, as we most certainly will, uh, we have to contemplate a revised um, piece of legislation that maybe does not envisage one commission of information. Maybe we should look at dismantling that structure. Um, do we want to amend it uh, by retaining a single commission of, in of information or should we explore um, doing model. away with that entirely and explore a different model because there are several different models. Where you um, have an information officer within, within a public authority. So, so that might be the way to go. Also, I if you like look that also, if you look at the current act, it is very difficult to remove the current office holder. Um, if we keep the existing legislation, um, uh, it would be very difficult to remove him under the current provisions. If you contrast that with an ombudsman, for example, if you look in the Constitution, um, you will see that an ombudsman um, holds office for four years. The Commission of Information does not. He can only be removed. And I believe he himself wrote a letter Section six. to the press pointing out the provisions of Section 6, which says that the President may only remove a Commission of, a, of, inf of Information from office if he's a judge and insolvent, if he has been convicted of an offense which involves moral turpitude, is unfit to continue in office by reason of infirmity of mind or body, or has acquired such financial or other interests as is likely to affect his functions as commissioner. That section surely has to change. I would almost certainly because on fitness, agree. On, on fitness can only be under the act is infirmity of mind or body. What about w oh, and, and moral turpitude, which appears to have happened in, in your case? Removal requires conviction of an offense. Yes. So, regardless of what a person does, unless he's convicted of an offense, he's cool. That can't be right. I think it is. It, it would need significant amendment. And as I pointed out earlier, contrast that with an important constitutional office holder, like an ombudsman who is only appointed for four years. We have a couple. We have four minutes. Thank you. We have four minutes. Um, what can we look forward to? What can citizens look forward to from Transparency Institute under this new administration, this new dispensation, and hopefully um, revised legislation? Let me take the first part. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what can the citizens look forward to um, under the new administration? Um, one major thing that we already know we, we, we want to work on is getting more persons involved in the work of transparency. Um, we did speak earlier about the fact that you know the change allows uh, for persons to be a bit more comfortable. We'd hope to be able to step out. And we've seen some of this already. We'd like to see that even more. We'd like to see persons uh, being able to become even more familiar with the work and the, the aspirations of the institute and owning that as theirs and becoming a part mm -hmm. of that. So increasing that, 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 that reach in terms of the base membership is one critical thing. Um, and being able to, with that, get persons involved um, at the community level all the way up to uh, being able to assess, to be, able to, to be informed first, rather, um, to be informed uh, about uh, the, 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 the uh, what corruption is and how they can identify and, and deal with it, and then to be engaged um, in, in work at the community and at the national level to be able to, um, one, be empowered to speak out 
and be empowered to act uh, to uh, eliminate and, 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 and um, uh, address those issues of uh, corruption. What would you say, as a former president, Gino, what would you say to Mr. Bernard and his aspirations and, 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 and plans? I think Mr. Bernard is well positioned to uh, undertake and achieve uh, a lot of the objectives he's outlined and to continue our calls that we have been made that we have made but to uh, close off in relation to your final question what can the public expect from us I think um, the opportunity is ripe for us to continue several of the calls that we have made which not only relates to improving the Access to Information Act but also our calls for uh, election campaign finance reform the appointment of an integrity commission, uh, whistleblower legislation, uh, modern anti-corruption legislation, improving uh, the Ghana police force to deal with uh, serious white collar crime and to deal with serious corruption. So those are calls that we have made in the past and those are calls we now need to actively engage the new administration in. I, I, the operator is ignoring that we have just 45 seconds more, um, so I'll ask a final question. Do you see, because of timing, the our Guyana rising, improving in its the, in, in the CPI, the Corruption Perception Index, in 2015? It is hardly likely. We are six months into the year already. I think so too. And for next year? For next year. It would require the government working with Transparency Guyana. Ground. <laughs> Motivation. <laughs> Mr. Calvin Bernard, President of Transparency Institute, Guyana Inc. Mr. Gino Passaud, former President of Transparency Institute. I want to thank you very much for appearing on Plain Talk this evening um, to give us a historical account, um, an assessment of some of the challenges and some indication of your own aspirations and plans. I want to thank the operators and viewers uh, for sharing for the operators for their excellent work once again and viewers for sharing this past hour with us. So all that's left for me to say thank you. Good night. <laughs>